Hi, I'm Sean McCants. I'm the community architect for CentOS, and I'm here with my friend and colleague, Justin Flory, who is the community architect for Fedora. Uh, and we are at Red Hat Summit on the Expo Floor Hall in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, Justin, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm, I'm, I'm doing really good. I'm kind of exhausted, but yeah. uh, I'm doing good. Um, so why don't you tell us about, a little bit about what, what is it do you, that you do as the Fedora Community Architect? So in Fedora, the Fedora Community Architect role, I think, has often been shaped by the whoever the person is that's in the role. Mm -hmm. But at a high level, a lot of the things that I do in the community is to help support our folks who are doing community work to be successful and collaborate and work together. And then there's a lot of the administration, administravia kind of work. So I, I work with the, a lot of our events, the event organization piece, and this year we've got uh, our first return in four years of our Fedora Contributor Conference flock. Mm -hmm. We also have our release parties, which at least at the recording time will be next week on uh, the first week of first weekend of June. So a lot of that is event support and management. I also do work around helping manage the project budget and provide that uh, that window into how Fedora spends its budget to the community. And then I think kind of a large assortment of other smaller things. One of my like personal things is when I was in a volunteer role before, before I came into Red Hat was I worked with the community operations team and they were very much hands-on with kind of helping other teams collaborate and work together with each other or helping make sure that important events and things happening in the community, even if it wasn't like a, uh, like a release party, but like, hey, the Python SIG is, back in the day, we're doing my, migrating Python 2 packages to Python 3 and they needed help and we helped them promote like, hey, there's this opportunity to help and get involved with with the Python work in Fedora. So, like, there's some things that I have a soft spot for that kind of work and doing that kind of uh, operation style work with the community. But uh, I think that's kind of the big pieces of what the role looks like. Before I got to this role, I've been in the Fedora community for about going on eight years this year. Mm -hmm. uh, I first started as a a fret, hardly even a freshman in college when uh, in 2015 uh, I was just had graduated from high school and I was I was committed to going to the Rochester Institute of Technology in New York coincidentally or maybe call it fate one or two weeks before the first week of classes the Fedora flock conference was in Rochester and at that time I had been hiding in the IRC channels and lurking in the spaces and kind of watching but never really taking my step into the project. So then I was like, oh, Fedora's coming to Rochester. And I was just about to like move my whole life up there and relocate and I was like, you know what? I'll go up a week early and check out this, what this Fedora thing is all about. Mm -hmm. And the rest is all history. Like after that, I went on to make my first contribution in the Fedora magazine. I had done a lot in, a, in another past life. I did a lot with a open source gaming server called Spigot for Minecraft. And uh, I had done a lot of that open source work there. And then coming into Fedora, I wrote an article in the Fedora magazine on how you can, how you can uh, set up a Spigot server to play Minecraft with your friends on Fedora. So then from there, I got more and more involved over the years. I, I helped build the community operations team and what was at the time the diversity team, which has now become the, the diversity, equity, and inclusion team. Uh, I used to do a lot. I used to help run the Fedora marketing team and the Fedora join SIG. For a brief time, I was helping do some work with the game SIG and trying to do some program management kind of work there. And I've done an assortment of all other kinds of things over the, the last few years, but a lot of it on the what we call the the mindshare parts of Fedora or, or the non-engineering parts. It's the stuff that really makes the project tick. I mean, engineering is, of course, important and because we're, we're building a software pro project, um, but ultimately Fedora is, is people and we, we need people connecting with people to, to move the project forward. So um, that's cool. That was actually, you went straight into what my next question was because uh, <laughs> You know, because I, I know you're, you're somewhat new to the, the community architect role, but you're certainly not new to, to Fedora as a project. So you, you my secret power history. there was I, I've worked with all the three people who are in this role before me. So I, I knew 
Remy de Cosmaker, who was the first person who was in the Fedora community architect role. And then it was Brian Exelbeard for a few mm -hmm. years after that. And then Marie Norden. And all of them I, I consider friends and, and as well as colleagues too. Um, but I've had that advantage of seeing since this role was created, how each of them have taken it. You know, there's the core parts of the role, but also how each of them put their their spin on it and bring whatever their talents and abilities are into the role and kind of get to amplify that. Yeah. Well, and all, all except for Brian are RIT grads, I think, so <laughs> yeah. we have a Rochester conspiracy. So. <laughs> Um, so I want to talk about the show here, but first, uh, you mentioned Flock is upcoming. I think we have an announcement about that? Yes. So probably by the time this podcast goes live, our call for proposals is now open. In addition to being in the wonderful city of Cork, Ireland on August 2nd to August 4th, uh, we are also going to be using a new CFP system, which if you've used the DevConf system before or uh, perhaps some other Red Hat family events. Uh, we're using the same system. So if you've done DevConf proposals before, you'll recognize the whole interface for Flock. It's a little different from how we've done it before, but that CFP will be running until June 20th is our, is our cutoff date. And so from there, we're going to be making decisions on the talks and building out our scheduling for, for the conference this, this August. So if you're out there listening and thinking about jumping into Flock, definitely check out the call for proposals because now is the perfect time to get some content in for this year's event. Yeah, and I will I will add to that. Uh, very exciting from from the CentOS angle. Uh, we are actually going to be co-locating a CentOS Connect event at Flock, so we will be there. Uh, we'll have a dedicated CentOS track embedded in the first day of Flock, um, and that will be our our CentOS Connect event, which we run we run these a few times a year and always kind of co-located with with other events, so that we can have you know these kind of good good partnerships, good communications with other uh, other projects and stuff. So we're very excited. We will have our CentOS Connect at Flock, uh, and we are sharing the whole, the same CFP system. So yeah. um, the CFP information will be, will well, when you're watching this, it is, but it will be available on the, on the Flock website, and we'll point the CentOS Connect website to the Flock website for all those wonderful details. So I'm excited. I'm I'm excited to go to Cork. I've never been. I've never been to Ireland, uh, and I'm really excited to have an in-person flock again because it's been yes. it's been a while. You know, there there were definitely some, you know, challenges I guess coming through it this year. Like when we came into it last year, when we started sitting down for flock, we knew we wanted to bring it back to in-person, and originally we thought we were going to do it in the U.S., um, which uh, you know we haven't had a U.S. flock since Cape Cod in 2017. Yeah. Uh, and I was even, you know, talking to people around here at Red Hat Summit. There's a lot of Fedora friends and folks who, who I've known in the Fedora community for many years. And then I'm like, oh, like, you, they haven't been to like a flock event even since Cape Cod, long before even like COVID had taken over the world. So mm -hmm. I was like, oh, like, I do think we need to come back. We were going to try to, we tried one last third time for that Detroit bid. I know, but for a number of reasons. Previously, it was because of COVID. This time, we found out that we have we have our, our wonderful, amazing contributors who are in South America, Latin America, and India. And for folks to get visas to come in and travel, at least this year, the appointments are all backed up for at least two years, and in some case, three years, just to get a first appointment. So for that reason, we looked at the, the Emerald Isle and saw that uh, South and Latin American folks don't need a, in most cases, don't need a visa and folks in India should be able to get a, a business travel tourist visa in a couple weeks. And uh, in addition to that, we have some wonderful friends in, in Cork and the nearby city of Waterford who are uh, helping influence the fun social activities and things that we will do together as a community in Cork. So overall, I think it was a, you know, it was a, we were, we were kind of figuring out where we're going to land it and how everything was going to work this year because we haven't done it in four years. Yeah. But, you know, I think the, the approach is that we got to start from somewhere, and you know I, I'm really excited that we're bringing it back this year and getting back into the habit of doing in-person events because those connections and those encounters and those hallway conversations are so important. Right. So I'm excited that we're making that step to bringing Flock back to in-person, and hopefully we'll have more opportunities for in-person connections as we go into the rest of the year and 2024. Sure. So, 
we are at Red Hat Summit. We are, I'll just set the scene here. Uh, we're on the expo floor and Red Hat Summit is, is Red Hat's really kind of premier flagship, very product focused uh, conference, right? Red Hat is a business and they, they do a, a businessy conference. So there's an expo floor here and Red Hat has a few booths all around uh, and then various other vendors and partners have booths. And we have this area here on the expo floor called Community Central. Uh, which is staffed by people from the Open Source Program Office and other areas within Red Hat that showcase um, some of the upstream open source projects that Red Hat participates in. Um, not all of them, because that would be a uh, that would be the whole expo floor. But uh, <laughs> but some some of the uh, you know high visibility strategic uh, projects. And in this one corner of it here, um, are, I'm not I sure how much the backdrop backdrops. is is in the video. I don't know if it goes all the way up to the logos. Top, but, Maybe we can um, use this as the thumbnail for the podcast. Yeah, it's really good. We'll zoom in. Um, we have over here the, the platform, the Linux corner, uh, where we're talking about Fedora and CentOS um, and all of the related stuff. I know we've got Carl here talking about Apple as well. Uh, Matthew Miller, the Fedora project leader, is, is here with us. So, um, yeah, so that's that's kind of this area that we have here and there's other areas talking about other, other open source projects. Uh, anything to add to that? Is that a good picture of where we are? Yeah, I'd say, uh, you know, this is kind of the fun place to be. We got some arcade yeah. cabinets set up here in Community Central and, you know, I think what's cool is that we've actually had a lot of people who, uh, you know, people from inside Red Hat, outside Red Hat who come up and, you know, there's definitely a lot of familiar faces that I've seen and getting to connect with folks. Sometimes there's folks I haven't seen in four years that I'm seeing for the first time here, or, or I missed it one flock or another. So even though it's got a different feeling from say how we do flock, for example, I'm definitely getting a little bit of that community feeling, getting to see and talk with folks and uh, you know, getting, getting some of that, again, that in-person interaction that's just so, so helpful for I think many open source communities and projects. So that part I've definitely been enjoying and then people I think Maybe they appreciate that we can just talk about upstream open source too. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Won't have to necessarily have a sales bin, which right. you know is fine. But you know, a lot of what we do in the community projects, that's not our our. We're coming at it from a different angle, right? So it's definitely feeling like a good community spot to be. I think this is also where people are having a lot of good fun. We've got a community theater here with. Uh, there's a talk going on right now over there. I'm not sure what the schedule is for today, but they've got a packed theater with folks coming in to listen to content from all of our different upstream communities or from what our community architects or, or neighborly communities are doing. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty pretty lively spot here on the convention floor. And this is, this is your first Red Hat Summit, right? This is my first one. So I've been trying to just absorb it all and take it all in. And, yeah. you know, I really was trying when I was thinking about coming here, I was like, I don't try to think, what are people going to be wanting to talk to me about? Or what are people going to, what are the questions people will have? So really a, a lot of it has just been listening and uh, I had a great conversation with, uh, with a guy yesterday who uh, has written a ton of documentation about Fedora in Swedish and he wants to start upstreaming some of it. Awesome. And helping our Fedora docs team to get involved. And so I was talking with him about uh, about the documentation team and about our system administrator's guide, the Quick Docs project, and about how localization works. A lot of folks who are just passionate users uh, or are use Red Hat products in their in their job and might use a little bit of Fedora there, or a lot of times it's at home, or it's Fedora and CentOS at home. So there's it's, it's been interesting to see there's a very much kind of a user feeling here as well with the conversations we've been having. Mm -hmm. uh, which I really wasn't sure what kind of things, if it was all going to be around like, oh, like what's coming from Fedora that will go into RHEL, which definitely has come up. Sure. And is a big thing, because we're looking at Fedora 40 next year, which will be the, the base for CentOS Stream 10 and later RHEL 10. Um, but it's been a wide, it's been a pretty good range of topics. So I've really been enjoying the conversations I've been having out with uh, people here on the floor. Yeah. How about for you? How's it been on the CentOS angle end of things? Oh, a lot of the same. Um, people are asking kind of what's new in the pipeline. Um, and of course, CentOS, CentOS Stream 9, which is out right now, is, um, is what's going to feed into the next version, the next minor version of RHEL, which is RHEL, RHEL 9.3 will come out in, I don't know, five or six months. I, I'm not a product manager. I don't set schedules. Um, but, you know, when people ask me 
what's coming in in, in stream 10 and then rel 10 you know i tell them they need to watch fedora over the next two years because that's really going to set you know set the scene for for 10 basically so um yeah a lot of conversations about what's what's coming up next you know what what is coming up what should we be watching in the next year in well, Orlando. One of the best spots to look is there's some wiki pages that will tell you all the proposed and in, in progress changes for the Fedora release. Mm -hmm. But one that I'm really excited that's been, actually has been going on for a while and will finally land in Fedora 39 is changing DNF5 to the default package manager on Fedora. That's one that I've been watching because they've been landing some Again, kind of setting their own stage there for the last couple of releases. I forgot what they put into Fedora 38 for DNF 5. Um, but with Fedora 39, with it going into the, the new default, a lot of new users, anyone who does a new install is going to get that DNF 5 experience out of the box. And it comes with a lot of performance enhancements. I know one, if you're a workstation or desktop user with GNOME and possibly with the KDE variants as well. If you would go into GNOME software, it has its own cache and is searching the package repositories and is getting that data. And then if you go in the terminal, it's doing that in its own little corner with the data. They don't talk to each other. They don't really share that data or the caches together. So in one sense, if you do something in GNOME software and then you're in the terminal, you'll be sharing some of the same metadata across the, the caches. And then also there's some huge performance increasements under the hood as well. Actually, what I remember now is that one of the things that was big this time in Fedora 38 was we added a new way of signing certain packages or RPM Sequoia, which was a, a swapping out RPM's default PGP encryption mechanism for signing packages and replacing it with an open source implementation parser for open PGP, which is called Sequoia. Okay, cool. So that was, you know, there's a lot of really cool things that are going into the package management mm -hmm. end of things lately, which I wouldn't say is, uh, there's always things happening there, but just some more exciting things that I haven't seen in a while. So I know that's kind of one of the big thing, but if I look at the Fedora 39 change list, just of what's been proposed, we already have 16 accepted system-wide changes. So system-wide changes are things that affect everybody. Like we've got things like RPM 4.19, Perl 5.38, uh, Python 3.12, and then we have 12 self-contained changes, which are the more uh, isolated changes. They're not necessarily disrupting other people's work, but if you're using uh, like a desktop environment or you're a Go developer, then maybe there's some things you should check out that are happening there. Uh, like one of the ones that I see here for Fedora 39 is having uh, Fedora images on Azure web services. Um, and also Font Awesome 6, having a, which apparently was a pretty big deal in the font world that uh, it's a total re-architecture of the packaging and it's a pretty major update to Font Awesome, which is where you get a lot of the icons oh, and yeah, yeah. Uh, little, no, it's kind of a, to me, a like an air quote font because yeah. it has all these extra little things in it. But uh, yeah, there's some cool stuff that's coming down, but DNF5 is kind of the one, because uh, I've been watching that one. I'm excited for that one. Sure. So that's what I'm we'll, seeing now. We'll always see, I mean, every version of Fedora is, will come with the latest version of, of GNOME for the workstation, right? Because they're yes. also on a six month cycle, so it's, it's very fortuitous, I guess, that the, so. There usually is always some new GNOME Fedora workstation, work, workstation goodies that are coming out of the box. Yeah, I always like, uh, it, it's a very visible change, right? When, whenever you click that button to get the new version of Fedora, you know, and you kind of see what, what new shiny stuff is in front of you, so yeah, it's, uh, I, it's always fun. And actually, I might get in trouble for saying this, uh -oh. but I recently switched from i3 to GNOME. I used to be a GNOME user way back in the beginning, but um, I, I love window tiling managers and I love i3 for a number of reasons. I, I needed to go with something different and I was uh, switched back to GNOME on Fedora and actually I've been really happy with it. Um, cool. Feels like it's a very polished experience now. I mean, it has been for a long time, but I've just been 
I'm getting back to it after like probably since Fedora 24 or 25 now, so it's it's been a while. But as an as an old GNOME developer, I'm, I'm happy to hear <laughs> that. So I remember GNOME like 1.4, and that was a <laughs> wild west of desktop systems. So. Wow. So, like, I have this list of questions, but then our conversations have just like gone organically, and you've answered most of the questions without me even asking them. Um, I guess, uh, are there any other like interesting conversations or questions you've had at the things, or have people asked? You know, I get some times people ask me, "Well, when sh when should I use Fedora? When should I use CentOS? When should I use RHEL?" You know, uh, like. Or, or why should I choose these things over, you know, other Linux distributions that exist in the world? Um, yeah, these kinds of questions, or, or in general, like, what's your take on why should people care about Fedora? Yeah, and I think, you know, when you dig into it, a lot of times you can't talk about, when you're talking about distributions, you can't talk about Fedora and without talking about CentOS, without talking about RHEL, without talking about Apple, even. So I love, we, on, our, on our booth here at Summit, uh, Sean put together this really awesome sticker sheet that, in addition to being a sticker sheet and giving you all the CentOS, Fedora, Apple, and Red Hat logo, it also was a visualizer of explaining how all the projects flow together and are actually really closely interdependent and connected on each other. So, you know, I think this is a conversation we have even a lot of times, not just at Red Hat Summit. You know, I think I, I, Matthew Miller has a really nice way of explaining around the too fast, too slow problem is that Everyone might have different levels of newness and freshness and stability that they're looking for. And you know, there's never gonna be a one size fits all. Everyone's got their own specific requirements, their own environment. What one person's needs are might not be someone else's. So with Fedora, you know, we're, we're often working with the latest and greatest of what's happening in the free and open source operating system environment. We, we work on a, we have a new release every six months. Every release is supported for about a year. And then, um, you know, I, I also think it's not, you know, there's always this thing about bleeding edge, cutting edge. I, I wouldn't say Fedora is bleeding edge because we have a really amazing quality assurance and quality engineering team who help make sure that changes get tested. You know, it's not maybe as rigorous as some of the enterprise grade, but we have folks like we have new test days every release uh, for folks things that are coming like those changes I was just talking about. Maybe the Fedora QA team wants to have a wider sample of people who are running new changes. So there'll be test days where they're like, hey, if you're in the community and you want to help out Fedora, grab the the ISO, give it a run, and try out doing this test case and let us know what happens. So there is a quality assurance process that's there. It's not like Arch where things are just free flying in all the time and like, oh. Your kernel broke today, or something wild happened, and you have to fix it. Fedora does have that stability, but it's not at that necessarily enterprise grade. So if you're looking to get, like, touch what those cutting edge, latest and greatest releases of your favorite upstream projects, or, or programming languages, or system administration tools, Fedora is a great place to be. But it does move pretty fast. Uh, you know, for me, I've been on Fedora since Fedora 20, so to me, it's like, oh, it's it's a perp it's fine. Uh, six months is fine, but. Um, everyone, again, everyone's requirements are different, but if you like having that easy access to what's like current and new and, and kind of in the process of being proven, Fedora is a great place to be. But once you're, if you say you're looking for something that has a little bit slower speed, but still has some of the newer versions of what you're looking for, it's a little more up to date, CentOS Stream now fits this really nice role in between Fedora and and RHEL. Oh, maybe, do you want to talk about that one a little bit? Oh, I, I think that puts it very well, actually. You know, I mean, I think uh, a lot of people who are using CentOS, um, you know, it, it are often using it in a server, in, server environment. Of course, you can use it on a workstation. I have a, a demo computer I always bring um, to, to uh, conferences and show off, and it's, you know, it's got CentOS on a, a workstation kind of setup, but, you know, people are often using it in a server environment, and they just, they don't want to have to deal with, you know, they're running an application that doesn't need, say, uh, a newer version of Python or something. It runs on the existing version, um, and so they don't want to have to deal with a an operating system upgrade, right, every six months, or I suppose once a year. You can do a skip version with Fedora. Um, 
So you know, people like that 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 longer, the five-year life cycle uh, for those kinds of environments. But then you know, for me, um, you know, on my laptop I run Fedora because I I do want every six months the new thing just because it's nice and new and shiny. So um, yeah, I think that that about sums it. Yeah, sums it pretty well. So and I think it just to me, it, I, for a lot of the things that I'm running, like I have some tiny workloads and some digital ocean droplets and I've been running stream on those because you know I don't always think to go in and log in and update and check them frivolously. I've got certain things on automatic update policies but it's nice just to be able to log in time to time and not have to keep up with the major operating system upgrades. I've just got tiny stuff like different microservices running and for that sense OS stream has been perfect because I also keeps me a little bit closer to Fedora in terms of newness. I mean I'm a a little bit ahead of what I'd be getting on like a more on like uh, RHEL or Alma Linux or Rocky, but uh, I still get more of that life cycle that fits my use case and my need better there. Yeah. Because I'm not, you know, if I were doing more kernel hacking stuff, I might be looking a little bit more towards towards RHEL. But I mean, I'm just I'm basically running containers and running a web server and maybe a database here and there. So. For that use case, for me, Stream is, is perfect for that. And then I do have one Fedora server, but I, I, I use that as kind of a playground for things that I keep up with that one a little better than the rest of them. I think our 20 minute chat has gone for half an hour now. Uh, we had some good conversations we here. We did. I think Matthew probably wants us back to the boots. <laughs> we got a break. Um, how do you want to like, wrap this up? Like, how would people. How would people find out more about Fedora or how to get involved in Fedora? Quick, Great question. Yeah. yeah, so I'd say, you know, Fedora is a really huge project and we do have this uh, on the television in our booth. We've got, we've been putting up this organization chart, which is a huge thanks to Marie Norden for uh, creating that infographic and trying to actually map out this huge community we have. So in Fedora, it's kind of actually a tough question, like where do you get involved? I'd say a great place to start if you're if you're not really sure about anything and you're just trying to learn, we do have a joint special interest group or SIG that is a group of real human beings who will help you get kind of onboarded and started in the community, will kind of like show you some of the basic ropes, what you need to be an effective collaborator in the community. But otherwise, if you have a more specific interest, like say you're interested in IoT or you love KDE, you can look for some of these special interest groups or teams that are doing some of that either packaging work or outreach or marketing. We do have a Fedora marketing team and they do a lot of our social media and I know they're a really great group of folks to work with. I'm jealous of your marketing team, by the way. That's <laughs> well, I gotta give Joseph and the rest of the folks there some credit because it is definitely a community community owned and driven team. So they are doing some great work there. Uh, but I'd say those are great places to start. You know, also docs.fedoraproject.org is a good way to explore. You can find different teams and their own documentation there. And a lot of times a team might have more specific guidance on how you would get involved with their group. Like maybe the KDE SIG will have some guidance. Oh, if you want to help here, and I don't know this, but you know, packages that they could use help on adding into the distribution or maintaining, or even just doing some of the outreach and letting people know that like the KDE experience on Fedora is awesome. So uh, I also do want to take advantage of this time, kind of as we're on the call to action piece here, um, with the Flock CFP coming up, I will just remind it's uh, closing on June 20th of 2023. So make sure you get that proposal in on cfp.fedoraproject.org. I did just want to give a big shout out for two folks who helped us get all the infrastructure in place for that, for Yosef Ridke and Kevin Finzi, who as always are super helpful with all of our all of our needs and requests, even if they come in a little bit late. Yeah. We wouldn't be able to do it without both of them. So I just wanted to give a kudos on the, our new CFP system that wouldn't have been possible without both of their help as well. Sure. And I hope hope some of our listeners will consider dropping something in there or pay, perhaps coming to make a visit on the Emerald Isle later, later this year. Awesome. Well, uh, Justin, thank you so much for sitting down and talking to, well, me and the world. Uh, I will now say goodbye, which is weird because I'm going to spend the rest of the day with you. <laughs> uh, but I will see you and hopefully everyone else in Cork in August. Yeah, thanks for bringing me on. Thanks, Justin.